So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to day two, your part two penultimate session. This particular session is just before our OECS Island Ideas Challenge competition announces its winner. So this session will also create a lot of stimulating topics, stimulating conversation. It is titled Our Resilient Health Systems in Our OECS Countries. What does it take? our COVID-19 story. I'm your moderator for the next hour, Dr. Safiya Mohammed. I sit as multiple roles in Trinidad and Tobago, the medical director to Health Direct Services and CEO to CISU Global Wellness. On this particular panel, we have the opportunity to be hearing from Dr. Joy St. John, Natalie Irvin Matux, Dr. Carleen Radix and Dr. Josie Gonzalez. We start with Dr. Joy St. John, where she'll be sharing on lessons from the Caribbean COVID-19 experience. Allow me a minute or two to share on this incredible personality. Dr. Joy, Dr. Joy St. John rose in the ranks of public health in Barbados from 1994 to become the first Barbadian Chief Medical Officer of Barbados in 2005. She then represented Barbados on the executive board of the WHO and became the first Caribbean person to chair the executive board from 2012 to 2013. Dr. St. John finally left the post of CMO in 2017 when she became the Assistant Director General of WHO headquarters in Switzerland. There, she held the portfolio of climate and other determinants of health and successfully completed the first phase of the Climate Change and Health SDS initiative. In July 2019, Dr. St. John became the Executive Director of the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CAFA. This CAFA has led the public health response in COVID-19 pandemic, and Dr. John's leadership is what we have seen over the 200 speaking engagements about COVID-19 as she engaged with multiple sectors and the health leaders and other heads of government in CARICOM. We now welcome Dr. Joy St. John. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. And I'm going to share my screen. So I want you to let me know when you see it in slideshow. Are you seeing and it in it slideshow? slideshow? So thank you very much for this opportunity to be on this panel. And I'm going to talk about lessons from the Caribbean's COVID-19 experience. And the first thing I'm talking about is leadership, coordination, and resource mobilization. This region has seen stellar leadership from the heads of government. And the photograph on the left shows you the heads of government who have led since January 2020, starting first with the Honorable Mia Motley of Barbados, then the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez of St. Vincent, then the Honorable Keith Rowley of Trinidad and Tobago, and currently being led by the Honorable Gaston Brown of Antigua and Barbuda. And all of this has been supported by the CARICOM Secretariat. Not only did they support leadership, but they supported the involvement of many sectors in this whole response. And we could not have done it without resource mobilization because COVID-19 is expensive to address, especially the medical treatment. And this is just some of the donors that have supported CARFA with money which we use to help with the purchase of vaccines through COVAX, the purchase of PPE, equipment, testing reagents. And so this is at the background of what you have been seeing in our COVID-19 response in the CARICOM region. Very early on, it was clear that we could get nowhere with this pandemic if we were not vaccinated. And I feel so proud of the CARICOM region because the CARICOM region not just sought to procure, but we sought to do it together. And so when we started getting donations, you will see on the right, some of the sources of vaccines for the CARICOM region. When we started to get donations, first from the government of 
of India we shared. And in the center, you see our SS, Regional Security System Air Wing, when they delivered, and I call them the flying heroes of the CARICOM region. I do a schedule for them Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They go and collect samples to be tested by CARFA. At first, it was PCR, and now it's more for whole genome sequencing. And of course, we were determined in CARFA not to let any of the inequity that we had seen in many regions of the world affect anything that came through CARFA. And we devised a formula which had at the back of it our um, population pyramid and also our chronic disease burden so that we could apportion to the countries a fair allocation. And this is something that was agreed to and approved by the countries. So what have we been trying to do? All of us at the regional level, CARICOM, CARICOM institutions and the member states have been trying to balance lives and livelihoods where the most, if not the most, one of the top 10 um, regions for dependence on tourism. But it wasn't just tourism, our children had to go to school. We held many elections during this period and so CARFA tried to support all of the sectors by developing um, infographics and guidance, which showed us the right way to balance lives and livelihoods for all the sectors. But we also had going on a communication, well, let's say a misinfodemic. And so CARFA sought to produce communications messages that were targeted for our audiences. We didn't do just a population-wide approach. And we also did a vaccine hesitancy survey because we realized that vaccines hesitancy was quite an issue. And we have been developing along with the regional um, health communicators network, specific messaging to try to get the correct messages. And so in trying to keep the CARICOM region together, and in trying to make sure that the response was relevant, we have been trying also to strengthen our systems and to ensure that once we come out of this pandemic, we are a stronger and more resilient region. Over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Dr. John. That in itself was quite concise. We do have already questions in the chat. For all of our attendees here, we will indeed be taking the questions at the very end, but feel free to share the additional questions you would want at any point in time in the chat. Moving on to our second presenter. We do know the extent of COVID-19, how it continues to affect every single life, especially within our region here in Trinidad and Tobago. Our next presenter, Natalie Irvin Matux, will bring to us, she will be sharing on specifically global best practices on the health system resilience. Allow me the opportunity to introduce to you our next presenter. Natalie Irvin Matux is the Executive Director of the Caribbean Training and Education Center for Health, CTEC, a regional organization that has had the past 17 years supported countries in successfully addressing health workforce and health system challenges. She provides managerial and technical guidance to ensure cohesion between the organization's goal and objectives and its program design, implementation evalu and evaluation. Under her distinct leadership, the team at CTEC implements and disseminates innovative, timely, and valuable intervention, health interventions and expertise that contribute to formulating effective and sustainable public health practices, critical, against, critical to fighting HIV, AIDS, and other chronic illnesses. 
Mrs. Irvin Matux has over 25 years of progressive and diverse experience as a leader, manager, technical advisor, and evaluator of public health and development programs. Before her current role, Mrs. Irvin Matux worked as a director and deputy country director for the University of Washington's International Training and Education Center for Health, ITEC in Seattle, USA. Before this, she did indeed serve in various circles of the Jamaica Social Policy Project and the Ministry of Health Epidemiology and Research Unit in the HIV Project and Regional Coordinating Unit of the Caribbean HIV AIDS Regional Training Network. Mrs. Irvin Matux has a Bachelor of Science has a science Bachelor of Science degree in International Relations and Human Resource Development and a Master's in Business Administration. In addition, she has a doctoral she's a doctoral candidate in the Public Health of the Atlantic International University. I welcome Miss Natalie Irvin Matux. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for having me. So we have been talking about health systems resilience for some time, but I think that it has become more prudent or, or more urgent for us now as some of us experience the, the pandemic. Uh, it's becoming, it has become more important, I should say, to us. In the, especially in the Caribbean region, because we have seen how COVID-19 has really impacted our health systems. So what does it mean? Um, what, what is health systems resilience? So let me just take you um, through that a little bit. So resilience is defined as the ability to prepare for, manage, which is to absorb, adapt, and transform, and learn from shocks. Thomas et al. Shock is a sudden and extreme change that impacts a health system. So the Ebola crisis, the Zika virus, COVID-19, those are recent pandemics that have caused shocks to the national health systems in the region. Resilience is not just about bouncing back though to the pre-shock state. It's about evolving into something better. So as you would have seen that we are experiencing from these pandemics, the Zika, COVID-19, there is now the need for a new norm. What will be the new normal? That's the question. Health systems are resilient if they protect human life and produce good health outcomes for all during a crisis and its aftermath. Now, let's move to looking at how do we actually assess health systems? So response to a crisis, be it a disease outbreak or other disruption resulting in a surge of demand for health care, needs both a rigorous public health response and a highly proactive and functioning health care delivery system. Now, um, as you can see from my slides to um, from uh, my left, there is the WHO framework that describes the health system in terms of six core components or what they co consider to be building blocks. These need to be able to function effectively during and after a crisis. Now, what are these six building blocks? We're looking at service delivery, looking at the health workforce, information, medical products, vaccines and technologies, financing, leadership and govern governance. So these are six health system building blocks that we, are, we know that we, we generally discuss, especially within our region. Now let's move. If you look at my right, there is a diagram there. And this is actually a framework put together by the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. So they've just published a new policy brief and it outlines our focuses on health systems resilience and it outlines this four stage shock uh, cycle or what they would consider to be a risk management strategy. So remember we define resilience as the ability to prepare for manage and learn from shock. So let's look at the stages. So for stage one, you're talking about preparedness of the health systems to shock, right? What does this look like to, for us? So this stage is related to how open 
or how vulnerable a system is to shocks. In this phase, the system needs to get ready for shocks before they actually happen and also identify optimal responses. This requires some scanning of the horizon to anticipate what kind of shocks may be realistic threat as different threat may require different actions. Let's move to phase two, which speaks to uh, the shock impact and its management. Now in this phase, the focus is on timely identification of the onset and the type of shock, which requires a robust and comprehensive surveillance and early warning systems. Now, if you, if you look at stage three, uh, we're talking about um, as the shock impacts a health system and a society at large, the system should be able to absorb, adapt and transform. Now, absorption relates to incurring the system shock, but protecting the health system from profound resource imbalance by making available additional resources, either from reserves or contingency planning. Ad adaptation on the other hand requires absorbing the additional demand or reduced supply or both by making the health system more efficient, that is doing more with less or by changing the allocation of resources. When adaptation is not working or when all, e all easy efficiencies have been made, the system may need to change more fundamentally, that is to transform, to cope with the impact of the shock. So this may require a model radical rethinking of health system policy and resourcing and delivery of care. Now let's look at our final stage. That's the recovery and the learning phase. Now in this stage, when the shock has disappeared, what's next? You know, there is a return to some kind of normality, correct? Now, despite the ending of the imbalance caused by the shock, there may be still significant changes to the system that are a legacy of the shock. So that the new normal is not necessarily like the old. And we've been talking about the new normal after COVID or, or even right now, what's the new normal? So, so these four stages, as I said before, they are risk management strategies that, has, um, that have been put forward. You know, there are also other, there are strategies, you know, a whole suite of questions and assessment tools to really assist us in looking at our health systems. From, um, from an assessment point of view to ensure that we're managing risk and adapting as necessary. So let's look at some lessons learned from Ebola and COVID-19. So the, the, the importance of longer term planning and preparedness is, is crucial. Understanding health systems, strengths and vulnerabilities and how to respond resiliently to outbreaks. Effective and participatory leadership with a strong vision, effective communication and community engagement strategies will be critical. Surveillance enabling timely detection of shocks and their impact, ensuring the stability of the health system funding, motivated and well-supported health workforce, you know, and that has to be with task shifting. And this is an area that, for example, um, CTEC, which is my organization, have been working um, to support. And I can say, you know, there is, a, there is an example. When you look at, for example, in HIV, um, where, where we work, there is a cadre of healthcare workers called um, the, the, the contact tracers, or what we call contact investigators. Now, on the onset of COVID, the Ministry of Health scooped them up from the, from the HIV pandemic. And so we were, we were not able to utilize our contact investigators. So we had to be rushing and shifting in order to pretty much look for other ways to do our partner notification and, and so on services, looking for new contacts. So this is a way I'm talking about, you know, being able to bounce back task shifting, for example. Um, also, alternative and flexible approaches to deliver care, example, telemedicine, telehealth. And finally, integrated sound research and development strategies to enable the fast tracking of effective tests, vaccine, and treatment. And just to wrap up, my, my final slide is really some questions to you. 
you know, were the Caribbean countries' health system ready for COVID-19? How do we ensure better preparedness for shock? How do we sustain the new normal? And do we have a disaster risk management strategy in place for new crises? Thank you. Back over to you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you so much, Natalie. Indeed, a lot of food for thought in that presentation. And thank you all who are already sharing your questions. We will address them at the very end after each presenter has finished, completed their presentations. In continuing the discussion on resilience and more so now agility, we invite Dr. Carleen Radix. She's absolutely no stranger to this audience. Her topic is agility and resilience in health in the OECS. She's the head of the human and social division at the OECS. The human and social division encompasses health education and social protection. She's a public health physician and health administration leader in the Caribbean. She completed medical school at St. George's University in Grenada, a combined internal medicine and pediatric residency in the United States, and an occupational medicine and environmental health fellowship during which she completed her master's degree in public health. Dr. Radix has held various positions in clinical medicine, academia, public health, and administration in several Caribbean regions, and has consulted for regional and international public health agencies. Interestingly, her life purpose is to continue to contribute to each person's realization of their full potential. And she will now share with us on agility and resilience. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Mohammed. I apologize, I had some technical difficulties unmuting myself. It's really a pleasure to follow on from the presentation um, from Mrs. Irving Matux on resilience. And I'm going to speak a little bit about a cousin to resilience, and that is agility um, and agility in small island states. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and so I ask um, Dr. Mohammed, are you able to see the screen in presentation mode? We certainly can. Great. So um, we're going to speak a little bit about agility and the agility of small island developing states, and then speak about um, that in the context of health. And I want to look at agility a little bit differently. I think when we look at resilience, we often look at the gaps and the challenges. But in looking at agility, I want to bring to the fore the strengths that we have as small island developing states in the Caribbean and across the world. So let's talk a bit about agility. Uh, so what is agility? Uh, okay, so what is agility? And here is a formula that I found to describe agility. Uh, and really it's looking at the available speed over the required speed multiplied by the available changes over the required changes. And what do I mean by that? Really, if you look at agility drills in sports and many sports have agility drills. It's how fast you can change while moving forward, change direction, uh, change intent while moving forward towards the goal. So in order to get to where you need to, you have to dodge other opponents, you have to you know, be agile in order to get to where you need to go. So what are the available changes? What's the available speed that you have over what's required, and that's a measurement of agility. Let's look at, look at it another way. Really, agility is about the speed of response, how fast can you respond, and how many changes you can make within a given time. 
So going fast and changing quickly. This is what we're thinking about when we talk about agility. But there are a few more things we have to consider um, because you know, just moving fast and changing direction can cause a lot of confusion, as you can see here. And so sometimes we need to cut through the noise and look at some of the other aspects of agility. So with the speed of response and the ability to change multiple times, you need precision. So you need to be able to target the issue without disrupting the entire system. You also need comprehension. Uh, yesterday's session um, with Jack Canfield, he talked about being clear on the what, being clear on what the issue is that you have to target. Because once you're clear on the target, what direction you take and how many times you change direction, you know that you're going towards one particular place. And tied up with all of that is efficiency, because agility doesn't work if it costs a lot or if it takes a lot of time and bureaucracy. So there must be efficiency. The cost of change has to be minimal in order for you to keep changing. And there needs to be minimal planning rules that you can work within and shift easily. So these are some of the aspects of agility. I wanted to give some examples here. I, and I'm not a software engineer, so the software engineers out there Please forgive me if I, um, I'm not saying exactly what this is, but um, in looking at agility, there is this methodology called extreme programming or XP. And it's a specific uh, methodology in order to target quickly changes that may be happening. So it's a programming methodology that is rapid and adaptive it responds quickly to change. The methodology is people-based versus plan-based. So the idea is to get the software up, running, and out there with people using it, and then responding quickly to challenges that people have or upgrades that person suggests. It's iterative. So you don't expect that when you move out that it's going to be the complete answer. It keeps changing and improving. And it really is focused on active software versus design and documentation. So it really is about having something up, running, moving, and working with people, people's real experiences to quickly respond effectively to change. So how does this compare with our way, the small island way, and more specifically with the health system? And if I speak to the Caribbean, we have constant change. We have been described as the most disaster prone region in the world. We're continuously impacted by external and climate shock. And so when you have many things coming at you, you have to be agile. I saw um, uh, an ad recently in which you know the CEO is walking through and people are throwing coffee cups at him. And you know he's asked him, ask them to do that so he can be agile, uh, agile being the buzzword. But we've been doing this for decades and I don't think we appreciate how agile we are in our system. So often while we have to adapt and change to new things coming towards us while still getting things done. We certainly understand, I think uh, in this region, and on small islands that when things get tough, you need to depend on the people around you. And it's really the people more than even the system that can help move in terms of agility. You know, it's the relationships you have, it's the people that you know that can get things done in a pinch. And we all know after disasters, how communities come together, how it's the local people responding that's most important. Again, it's it has to be iterative because you have to respond immediately and that's not quite exactly where you want to be and we keep improving. And of course, things need to be up and running efficiently, minimum overhead, minimum cost. Um, and I think we're very good at determining what is the what and determining how we can move to get there effectively and efficiently. 
And it brings me to the Sustainable Development Movement Manifesto, because I think um, it's all related. Meaningful partnerships over processes and, processes and tools. We need processes and tools, but really we need meaningful partnerships to drive those action and impact. And in our health systems, certainly our CMOs know what is the target, what is the impact we want to get to, and they take action. Collaboration over contract negotiation. Dr. St. John spoke about the sharing of vaccines and the collaborative nature of the things that were happening quickly as we responded to COVID-19 um, in the Caribbean region. And responding to change, you know, and not just sticking to the plan. Sometimes we say that the, um, we, we make plans and then they go on a shelf, but, um, the other thing that we do is that we, um, and we think that's a disadvantage, but maybe we need to look We need to be agile to get there. So I thought I would just end with a little bit of this video to remind us. So back to you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you so much, Dr. Radix. Keep the eye on the goal. How, what better way can we comprehend agility and the need for resilience? We each would have had that opportunity to develop a resilient mindset throughout this pandemic as we move on. Now we move to Dr. Josie Gonzalez. She will be presenting on the grassroots perspective on health systems development. She has built a career spanning over 28 years in the NGO sectors in various executive management capacities, most notably as a grant maker and technical advisor serving on various banking and community development consortiums to develop affordable housing a public policy lead on anti-poverty, an executive director of a multi-service national housing model and creator of 511C entities. As the lead on the resiliency and regenerative initiative for St. Vincent and the Grenadines disaster relief in the aftermath of the recent volcanic eruption of La Soufre on April 9, 2021, her work focuses on the establishment of a resiliency hub to address long-term sustainability. Mrs. Gonzalez is a co-founder and publisher of a local nonprofit media organization, Public Square in the USA, a model she hopes to replicate in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The mission of both platforms will use journalism as a tool for civic and citizen engagement in various formats. Additionally, she's a management consultant for nonprofits and a facilitator on racial equity, anti-racism and implicit bias. She holds degrees from New York University, Rutgers University in the United States, and an adjunct professor at Medgar Evers College, the City of University of New York Political Science, and taught at Rutgers University, New York, on nonprofit management. We have the distinct opportunity to welcome Ms. Josie Gonzalez. Thank you so much. I to unmute myself. Thank you so much. Uh... Dr. Mohammed, and what stunning panelists I get to sit with. Um, let me, is my PowerPoint ready? Excellent. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, I want to thank my fellow panelists for being so stellar. Um, I'm last and I, I get to sort of um, breeze through on their brilliance. Um, I'm going to look, I'm going to sort of prevent, present um, sort of a systemic framework and then get to the unit of analysis being the individual. First, I want to say um, hello to the uh, rural women producers of St. Vincent and my partner, Jorlyn Lamkin. Uh, the quote from my father, if the banana man don't eat, nobody eat, was prescient in the 70s when he used it as an instruction to my little sister and me as primary schoolers playing with the livestock of laborers, as it was decades later when the US won its lawsuit against Asian Pacific Caribbean banana growers and our trade agreement on the Delome Convention. Banana export equals some 63% of our economy at the time. 
in the economic reality of North-South relations then, like other fellow banana exporters of the Caribbean, St. Vincent and Grandines experienced severe economic shocks with repercussions to this day. We face compounded economic and social crises from climate change, natural disasters, and a pandemic. This speaks directly to an international marketplace sustained by the over-financialization of capital with outcomes of deep economic and social inequality and instability of civil society in developing countries. Hence the critical role G20 nations must play in the UN Sustainable Development Goals 2030 if this planet is to survive. For the St. Vincent Grenadines rural women producers and affiliated civil society groups in North Leeward, the recent lockdown of the local economy as a consequence of the global pandemic and compounded shocks of recent volcanic eruptions, hurricanes and floods suggest a time to build long-term resilient and sustainable strategies for social and economic development and survival is now. We can flip to slide two. Speaking on the latest UN SDGs report, Claire Casey of Economist Impact summed it all up, quote, nations that fail women fail, quote. Of course, this includes developed nations. I submit the G20 economies as the producers of the largest CO2 emissions have a moral and economic responsibility to address the climate change and environmental crisis as a result of their economic development and expansion. G20 nations continue to subsidize unsustainable agricultural strategies in the developed world that produces well-documented global pollution and destruction of the environment, as one example. To this end, the G20 nations must consider financial investments in climate-smart agricultural strategies and infrastructure supports in developing countries as reparations. Here I suggest the CARICOM 10-point plan call for specific funding to address economic disasters from climate change and natural disasters augmented by feudal capitalism. Our economy rests in the future transformation of the agricultural sector through climate smart strategies. And in that process, placing rural women at the center. Uh, next slide, please. Our objective is to build a model of resiliency to create economic sustainability for multiple generations at the local village level by giving tools, training, and technologies to rural women. The UN SDGs provide a framework as a foundation. As we know, gender equality is bound up in all sustainable development goals, including climate justice, peace, security, economic survival, and social protection. What we know is that this work must be done at the local level. Localization works. Best practices exist in local communities in addressing persistent economic shocks and fostering resilience. Building systems to capture, nurture, elevate, and implement these strategies and the new paths that emerge are critical to building resiliency for multiple generations. We must identify solutions that balance the expected natural risk like those we experienced in 2021 volcanic eruptions, hurricanes, floods, soil erosion, with the capacity of the people and land to build a resilient society. Women must be at the center. If rural women are to manage the impact of escalating climate emergencies, the need for food security and nutrition sensitive produce, address soil degradation, manage economic instability, deepen human development and social well-being, and build a civil society framework to forge long-term sustainability, they must have access to land, capital, cash, credit, technologies, education, and political decision-making. Producing a resiliency path must be informed and driven by, from the periphery, specifically rural women producers themselves. As we are aware, aware, their research is consistent that women face the greatest disparities in economic, health, social, and educational outcomes. And for rural women, agro-producers, it is more severe. Next slide, please. In building a resiliency hub, it's critical to determine productive capacity of community land resources. And so here are some of the initial indicators I think we should look at, right? Identify the social and human levels of education and training. Assess levers of analysis. Examples include soil levels, uh, regenerative capacities, crops that promote carbon sequestration. 
percentage of arable land available, irrigation, crop rotation. They must have access to climate smart agriculture technologies to address clean energy, electricity, risk adaptation methodologies, implementation of strategies that protect the environment and promote resilience of the land. We must identify shared resources. We must remove hindrances to accessing financial investments. We must collect and analyze disaggregated data tracking to make decisions. We must invest in ideas, existing, new, and research-driven, the layers of foundation, collect better data, design policy, inform policy, and fund the work, which must be linked to the larger SD goals. Critical to all of this is collaborative local, regional, and international partnerships. Last slide, please. According to the last data reports from the St. Vincent and Grenadines Ministry of Agriculture, women comprise a little more than half of the population. But limited dis disaggregated data at this stage prevent deeper analysis on the roles women play in the labor market and ways in which work is compensated and documented. What is important to our work is making visible the work of rural women in agriculture in particular. Addressing gender equality lifts not just the standard of living of the women, but for the family, village, and society. Research shows the impact of successive economic shocks as a consequence of the above continue to deepen the inequality of rural women and girls in all social determinants, such as health, income, housing, education, and more. Therefore, we must work to dismantle the socially constructed roles and ascribe attributes that marginalize women and prevents them from building wealth and political power. Work, all work must pay. Everyone's time is valuable and contributes to the economic wealth and political stability of the society. We've selected North Leeward sector of St. Vincent to amplify the resilient strategies and codify these strategies as a model for expansion. The target area has notable baseline and foundational unique strengths and resources to build a resiliency hub that addresses deepening economic inequality and social dislocation. We look forward to reporting on next steps as we take on this work. And in closing, we must center politically marginalized voices like the youth, the poor, and women agro-laborers, workers, producers, among other stakeholders. In so doing, we have the opportunity to transform civil society, economy, and political decision-making. This process cannot be transactional. It must be collaborative, intentional, specific, and codified. Thank you all. To you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you so much, Josie. That really brought in, brought to home exactly what resiliency, agility, and what we have been doing right here within the Caribbean. Throughout all four presenters, we've had the themes, certain points being connected, established, that for collaboration, that for the need of resources, but more so the need for equity among resources. We're now going to uh, we're now going to address your questions. Thank you so much. Please continue to share your questions in the chat. Question two, this is to all of our panelists. An anonymous attendee actually shared, what do the panelists think about community health education that is compulsory, sort of like mandatory military service in some European countries? Even though not everyone will go to the medical field, the knowledge of the average citizen about how to manage health crisis safely or even first aid on some aspect of personal health is almost ubiquitous amongst the population. I welcome your, your thoughts on that question. Increasing our health education so that we can become a better, more resilient Caribbean people. Dr. Carleen Radix. Okay, Dr. Josie, uh, Josie no, no, no. Gonzalez. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'd give it to your doctor. I'm not a, um, a public health um, expert, but so I will speak as, as a layperson, as a member of the community. Now, you think, um, I think it's critical that we do, that we do do some form of what the, um, uh, the anonymous um, questioner is presenting. As a girl guide and a brownie, we did that. Uh, I think part of what we're seeing and what we're wrestling with, with uh, the attempt to vaccinate the global population is that we haven't really had a, um, a comprehensive public health message that sort of drills down. And that begins by having some background and making, making it part of civics and civic engagement. So I, I think he's, um, he's spot on on something. So 
And now we welcome Dr. Joyce and John. Thank you so much for your answer to that question. So I think it's a brilliant idea. And if we have any chance of it being successful, it's no. The pandemic has really been like community health 101 and understanding of epidemiology as well, an immersion in it. And so this is a good time to, to do that. I think that the vaccine hesitancy has a lot more to um, going on it rather than an understanding of community health. I think there are some issues of people feeling marginalized, people feeling rebellious against um, the government and establishment. So there are many things that have to be teased out with that, but I think it's a brilliant idea and full marks to the questioner. Thank you so much, Dr. St. John. There's another question if, from Dale Trotman. If health technology startups want to assist the region in their COVID-19 fight, how could the OECS facilitate this? Dr. Carleen Radix. Well, uh, I, I, I am grateful for the question. And it's really, in a crisis, we really see persons step up and with in terms of ideas and startups and solutions uh, to problems. So uh, I think that as a startup, first of all, the best way for you to be able to contribute to what's happening is to understand where the problems are and to come up with the solutions that are most relevant to the uh, resilience and agility of the healthcare workers and systems if, if, that are trying to respond. So I think that would be the first, the first uh, point I would want to make. Uh, I think once you are bringing a, a solution that is needed to a problem, then it's very easy to get um, health, health officials, um, organizations like the OECS interested in learning how to move things forward. So um, I would say that really if, if there are, um, easy, well, not easy, but user-friendly solutions to the problems that are being had, that this would be the first step in the process. You're on mute, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Radix. And, you know, we're really getting to the meat of matter of what is, or how do we develop a resilient system? Another person, another one of our attendees asked, how does one create a funnel system with a client base willing to actually pay or for developing a business plan? And this was directed straight to Natalie Irvin Matux. So we bring you into the conversation, Ms. Natalie Irvin Matux. Can you repeat that question for me? I'm, I didn't get it. Right. So in our chat, how does one create a funnel system with a client base willing to pay for developing a business plan? I believe they were talking about developing business technologies. Oh, how do they create a, a funnel for that? That's what you're, they're asking. That's what they ask. Yes. A funnel. Ah, I, I mean, to be honest, that I'm not I'm not sure I understand what the person is asking. So, so and I, if, yes, mm -hmm. certainly. If that person can probably put some more information in your question and answer, and then we can move to another one of our questions. We will certainly come back exactly to that question. There's an interesting comment in our discussion. The person shared a resilient health system is a population that follows a healthy lifestyle. Our grandparents lived until they were in the 90s. What happened in the span of a few generations? And how and can it be due to the, a decrease in the in the lack of accessibility to less nutritious foods. And I presume they were talking about lifestyle measures. With respect to developing a resilient health system, I throw the question out to all of our panelists. How important is our lifestyle measures in this development? Oh, I just... It's incredibly oh, it... important. Um... 
So Dr. Continue. Joyce and John, we start off with yourself. It's incredibly important. And making sure that you have a healthy lifestyle throughout your life cycle, even in utero, is critical. Because the, um, the, the fetus's development with a healthy diet of the mother is better than the development without a healthy diet or without a, a well-balanced diet, let's, let's say. So it's critical. And this is why CARICOM and CARFA are working on things like food labeling, labeling, front of package warning labels. So we have an idea of what are the constituents and what is healthy. That's why we're working on things like Caribbean moves so that there is an institutionalization of making sure that activity is in your day, not just special events or one-off, but we have to find a way to make the healthy lifestyle the easy choice. It isn't just a matter of each person doing what is right. There has to be a policy framework and environment that makes it healthy easy to be healthy and easy to choose to be healthy. Thank you so much, Dr. St. John. Josie, I do know you wanted to share some thoughts on it as well. Um, I, I think this is sort of part of the, the larger conversation um, we may not be having when we think about the, uh, the, uh, the discussion around to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. Um, and uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the rural women and the work that's being done, there are, there, are, there are many organic farmers in St. Vincent and many of them are relying very much on uh, the um, food, food nutrition, identifying proper herbs and all, there's a, there's a whole natural movement that comes out of a long tradition and a legacy of living off of the earth. And that has been part of, you know, we, we got our medicines from the earth. We got our medicines, we got our healing remedies from the earth. And I think that still exists in small island developing countries and it also exists in many countries in Africa. And I think we're not bringing that component into the larger conversation. I think people want to be recognized for making choices around their health. That's one piece. And the second piece is, uh, you know, one of the things that got me really involved in, in um, building the Resiliency Hub is at a press conference uh, when the Prime Minister of St. Vincent talked in post, post volcanic eruption, um, he talked about uh, the importing of foods, right? A lot of that food was processed food. Uh, but yet there were farmers that were, um, were, had produce for sale at the exact same time that conversation was taking place. And so one of the things that we have to be able to rely on in these challenging times is how are we developing the internal agricultural sector to address these challenges? Because we're going to see an increase as I'm sure that in the panels before us, the increase in hypertension, increase in diabetes as we eat more and more processed food. And so organic foods and uh, food that we grow must be integrated into a larger public health strategy. Thank you so much. And that's certainly brought to the forefront how important it is just maintaining our lifestyle habits more than just a habit, be, allow it to become a daily practice. We invite Dr. Colleen Radix as well to answer that question. Thanks so much, Dr. Mohammed. I just wanted to bring another perspective to it um, or an opportunity, I think, with COVID-19. You know, on the one hand, with COVID-19, we're more, we're spending more of our time behind screens as we work from home, educate from home, and there is the potential for a slippery slope. But at the same time, we're returning to a place where the family is together at home, where the family is together at home with more time. There's more time for cooking. There's more time to be outside. There's more time for exposure to plants that I knew the names of growing up that my children don't know the names of. So I think there's a double opportunity, especially for us in the Caribbean, to take advantage of what's happening with the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Indeed, very true. And there's one more question. So hold the mic right there, Dr. Radix, especially for, um, they ask, someone asks, what would be the best route to establish health services, more so digital services within OEC, for OECS? This is an excellent question that we are trying to effectively answer. Um, within the OECS, the question of digital services, and that's very broad, but really using technology to get to where we want to be, not just for the sake of technology or new um, things. Like I said in my talk, it's about knowing the goal, the target, which is better outcomes for our patients and getting there most efficiently. Um, and technology has a role to play in that because as small states, we don't have sometimes the economies of scale for certain types of health um, interventions or healthcare. So there is a role for digital health, for us to exchange, for us to collaborate, for us to have a collective that's better than individuals in, one, in, in each island. For example, we have a multidisciplinary um, cancer team, for want of, uh, want of a better word, that we call the Virtual Tumor Board, where multiple clinicians can speak to each other rather than being the lone specialist in one of the islands. This is some of the ways that technology can help us. So I don't know the answer, but we continuously are trying to answer that question and we welcome all collaborators in the process. So there's continued collaboration as you emphasized and Dr. St. John emphasized. Uh, in fact, all of speakers emphasize the need for collaboration in developing resilient systems. We will come to our poll, but we wanna give one final question before we bring this panel to an end. This goes to Dr. Joyce and John. One of our attendees asked, how were social and health inequalities considered in the design and planning your interventions related to COVID-19? So I would have mentioned it in my um, discussion. We developed a formula which was based on the population pyramid and also the burden of chronic disease and also risk factors. And we used this to ensure that whatever came our way, money, um, testing equipment, uh, PPEs, medical equipment for the use um, in the treatment of persons with COVID-19. We use that to ensure that whatever came our way was equitably distributed to our member states. We have 26 member states. And we also ensure that the member states agree to that formula. And so that's how everything was distributed. And of course, because of the dangers of the pandemic, we had to do all of our work virtually. And that allowed us to get a greater reach among our member states rather than a face-to-face -face where only a few countries could come to, um, to visit. So we found ways to reach even more people during the pandemic. So that is how we worked. Um, we made sure that there was equity in the services we delivered. And we're coming down to the very last two minutes of this panel. I believe we can continue this discussion all afternoon. However, I want to encourage you all to jump back on the auditorium as this one closes, because the OECS Island Ideas Challenge Competition, the winner will be announced. Before we come to a close, any of our panelists, uh, your final thoughts. We start with Dr. The person who presented at the very end. Josie, your final comments. Uh, well, um, this has been terrific. I've learned so much from my fellow panelists and I'm, I'm so pleased that I was um, invited to sort of share uh, the work of rural women. Um, they are usually sort of um, invisible. We talk about them on a systemic level, but they're usually invisible and I'm hoping I can place them at the center. The, the, the last thing I'd like to say, because I don't have a lot of time, is like, um, I want us, all of us, those of you in the audience and, and here, and, and those of us here to remember uh, that uh, Haitian women and Haitian girls um, are on their um, attack. And, uh, and I want us to call collectively to the UN um, Women Organization uh, on, on the response to what's happening to, um, to Haitian families. And so thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Josie.
Natalie Irvin Matuks, we invite you to share your last comments. 30 seconds. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, when you talk about some practical lessons learned from this crisis, I would say that one of them is definitely we need to become stronger as a region. You know, we need to, we've been talking about collaboration, but have, are we really collaborating? You know, what steps are we taking? There are so many things happening in silos. Are we supporting each other? Where I mean, tourism is a, is a big, has gotten a big hit. And that's an area that we depend on in the, in, the, in the region. I know we've spoken about this, you know, in several forums, but are we taking practical steps? Um, are we looking at how do we, you know, um, leverage our resources as Caribbean people? You know, for example, you know, I may be, be, be focusing on, on building, developing the workforce. You may be focusing on developing policies. So are we coming together to, to talk the same language to see how do we, I mean, we've been using the word pivot at this time to look at how do we work more effectively as regional partners. And I think this, um, this OECS uh, conference has given us an opportunity to, to keep talking, but let us start putting some things in action. How do we effectively partner? So I wanna take the opportunity to thank every single attendee here and more so our treasured panelists. Uh, we're pretty much out of time. So we need to, as Natalie utilized that word pivot, pivot into the OECS Island Ideas Challenge. Thank you so much for your attention and more so, thank you to our panelists who shared from their expertise, from their wisdom on the COVID-19 story. Over to you. Thank you so much, everyone.